From the dark, balmy, breezy, rolling hills of south-central Florida, just above the Everglades, home of the gators and panthers, spiders and snakes, boars and bears, this is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters. Today is Monday. It is March the 16th, 2015. Hope you had a good day and a nice weekend. Well, it's re-entry day. It's behind us now. Time to kick back and dive into some Far Out Radio. Lawyer, author, historian, theologian, philosopher, and 32nd degree Mason Robert W. Sullivan IV is our guest tonight. We'll be talking about his new book, Cinema Symbology, A Guide to Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies. Yes, we are going out on the skinny branches tonight. And when we're done, you'll never again watch movies the same. And we're not trying to spoil your movie-going experience But you should know what you're looking at. I mean, after all, it's right in your face, literally. So have you ever wondered why why 007 or 007 is James Bond's numerical designation? In the 1978 Christopher Reeves' Superman movie, what was up with those giant faces that passed judgment on General Zod and his lieutenants? And in that creepy and depressing movie, Black Swan, what was the symbolism behind all those breaking mirrors? I didn't like that at all. Cinema symbology connects the occult, numerology, astrology, mythology, alchemical, tarot, and cabalistic symbolisms contained in popular movies. Cinema symbology analyzes The Exorcist, Back to the Future, Star Wars, Episodes 1 through 6, Lord of the Rings, The Wizard of Oz, Black Swan, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, the James Bond movies, The Matrix, The Shining, and many others. And the book is a big boy. It's 503 pages, published by Rocket Science Productions, and it's been out since June 28, 2014. Of course, it is available at Amazon.com in print and in Kindle format. However, if you would like to get an autographed edition, you can buy it from uh, Robert's website. We'll give you the website address in just a few minutes. Rob's first book was The Royal Arch of Enoch, The Impact of Masonic Ritual, Philosophy, and Symbolism. This book is even bigger it's 690 pages, but when you're telling the story of the, of the Masons, it's that complicated. And I really do hope that the book has a flow chart because it definitely needs one. So, all right, well, let's head on out to those skinny branches with our guest, Robert W. Sullivan IV. Hi, Rob. Welcome to Far Out Radio. Hey, Scott. Uh, thanks for having me on. It's great to be with you tonight, and uh, I appreciate you having me on uh, Far Out Radio. Well, I saw your book listed on, gosh, we get, uh, we get updates from a variety of publishers and I saw the book in uh, one of the catalogs and I went, oh, this is a good one. I got to get this guy on. Now, earlier today, Rob, you were telling me that cinema symbology had its beginning in the last chapter of your first book, The Royal Ark of Enoch. And the chapter, the final chapter was titled, So Dark the Con of Men, Masonic and Enoch Symbolism in Cinema. Now, many of the movies that you talk about in cinema symbology were films that you saw as a child, a teenager, and a young adult. Were you subtly aware back then that scenes and images had meanings, or did you one day have an OMG experience? Oh, no, it wasn't. It, I, I didn't realize it. You know, when I was growing up as a child in the, in the 70s and 80s, oh, no, no, I mean, I was not aware um, of this at all. It really, it really didn't click in. Um, it kind of was like an OMG moment. I would say that probably happened in the early 2000s for, for me when I, I was, you're, you're right, I was writing, um, The Royal Arch of Enoch. And, and, you know, that, that was basically a book of 20 years of, of research, but, but, but it really was around the, the and you're right, the, the final chapter of the Royal Arch, do, uh, Royal Arch of Enoch does delve into some of the, you know, Masonic and Enochian symbolism. But it was really around 2003, 2004. I, I had seen and was aware of some of this stuff beforehand, like I knew, the Star Wars movie with the monomyth with Joseph Campbell. And I, I, I had, you know, when, when I was studying the material to put into the Royal Arch of Enoch, you know, all this occult, esoteric, mythological, you know, astrological, Kabbalistic, you know, symbolism contained within Freemasonry, the Blue Lodge, the High Degrees, I was kind of sort of applying it to movies I was watching. Um, and the one that really triggered it was um, the National Treasure movie with Nicolas Cage. Mm-hmm. The first one that was That's when it when it really kind of the, the the bulb went off that this is a Masonic ritual I'm watching on the big screen. Mm. Yeah, that was really in your face on that one. You couldn't miss that at all. It's, and the, I thought the beginning of it was really cool. I, I really liked the beginning of that movie. Oh well, yeah, I mean the the. Go ahead. I'm sorry. 
Oh, no, continue on. I was going to go somewhere else. No, go ahead. No, go ahead. Well, since you cover such a, a wide range, uh, time-wise, a wide range of films, one of the films that I was looking at the list of the films in your book that you analyze, and to put some time perspective on this topic, where I'd like to start is with the 1939 classic, The Wizard of Oz. Now, the book was political allegory. And I think that for most people that watch the movie or re remember the movie, for most of them, it's just a fantasy story. So when did people begin to catch on to what you refer to as the initiation into the mysteries? Because that's not something I was aware of, and I've seen the movie many times. Right, absolutely. That be you, well, I became aware of that when I began researching the author. The guy who wrote it was a man named L. Frank Baum, and he was a him and his wife were uh, members of a of an organization called um, Theosophy, which was founded by a Russian mystic named Madame Helena Blavatsky. Um, to make okay, a long yeah. story incredibly short, she was a, it's essentially neo gnosticism. It is, is what it is for for lack of a better word or words. But it's it's you're correct. You have the idea of it just being the you know girl going on an adventure, you know yada yada yada. Thanks for coming. Then you have this entire political allegory going on, um, which I also talk about in the book, which is a reflection. The book is really, or the story is really a reflection of 1895 to 1905 political, yes. socio-economic allegory in the United States. But then you have this much more deeper, you know, symbolism going on within the Wizard of Oz, where you have initiation into the mysteries, um, the girl being transported to a magical land um, to receive revelation or gnosis or knowledge or wisdom, which for her is, is that there's no place like home. You know, and you, you have the idea of her going up the winding staircase the ladder of ascension, which is for her the tornado, taken to the magical land, which is beautiful, but it's ruled over by the evil ogre, the monster. I mean, you'll find this paralleled with Jack and the Beanstalk, where he goes up the Beanstalk to the beautiful land that's ruled over by the monster. Um, this comes straight out of the world of Gnosticism. Um, this, ca this creature is called the Demiurge. It's, it's the lesser god. But at any rate, to receive, gnosis, she w to receive Gnosis or wisdom, she walks on the golden path of enlightenment, um, and of course, this le leads her to this false messiah. Um, and this is part of what what Theosophy sort of warned about was um, that organized religions were were suspect and could also often lead to false worship. And then, of course, Blavatsky. Another thing that was interesting is Blavatsky said to be initiated into the mysteries, you had to have intelligence or wisdom, uh, fortitude, and strength. Of course, Dorothy is joined by the three travelers who are all seeking this. So you have a, a very um, you know, a theosophical Gnostic theme going on in The Wizard of Oz, initiation into the mysteries. Um, you'll find this exact same theme paralleled in um, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, um, and you also find it in the Alice Siebold book and, and uh, movie, um, The Lovely Bones. Um, th th those three stories really, really um, echo each other. When you were researching the uh, metaphysical, mystical aspects of The Wizard of Oz, did you find any indication that people were tuning into this Back in the in the early early forties, when you know, well, the movie came out in nineteen thirty nine, uh, in right. late thirty nine. But uh, when did people start to catch on that there's something something else going on in this movie? The, the political allegory, you know, was somewhat well known. That was somewhat well known at the time. I think the you know the the whole initiation into the mysteries. Um, I can't tell you precisely when that became out. I can just tell you that in my research. You know, I, I discovered it in, in the process of writing the book and, and writing the Royal Arch book and just doing, you know, this voluminous amount of research. The political allegory is kind of somewhat more obvious in, on the surface, you know, with, uh, you know, the wizard being President McKinley and the scarecrow being the American farmer and the tin man being the laborer. There's a, I get into this in the book as well. Um, it's interesting, but that was somewhat more well known. But, you know, the whole idea of it being this, um, you know, for me, the the idea of initiation, and again, you'll find this in the Wizard of, oh, excuse me, in the Alice in Wonderland story, which is really almost the same story. You know, and Carol was into this. Lewis Carroll was into the same sort of material as well. Um, you, you know, you know, for me, it was really um, when I got tipped off to this was when I discovered that Baum was a member of of the Theosophy movement, uh, and, and you'll find this often a lot of times with authors who write these books or these stories, and then it gets turned into a movie. You'll find it out with Ian Fleming. Um, who, who was surrounded with the occult and mysticism. Um, of course, Baum with Wizard of Oz. Um, the other one that jumped, you know, Lewis Carroll with Alice in Wonderland. He was involved with um, very metaphysical societies. Oh, and then, of course, the other one that, you know, screams off the page is people like uh, Bram Stoker, who wrote Dracula. He was involved with a secret society called the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. 
Um, and, and within Dracula, you'll find it on the screen in a lot of the big screen versions. Uh, you know, I mean, you, I know you have the whole Vlad the Impaler thing, but you'll find this very, um, very embedded, very secretive idea of Eastern mysticism intruding on Victorian Christianity going on in Dracula. So, um, you know, when you research the authors of this stuff, you'll, you'll find their source material, and that's a good tip off that, uh, you know, that the, 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 the material they're writing, um, and which is ultimately made into the movie, um, contains this, you know, arcana. How involved was Frank Baum in the uh, mysticism? Oh, yeah. I mean, him and his wife were um, initiated or members, full-blown members into theosophy. Um, okay. And again, this was a, this is a um, sort of a neo-Gnostic group. It was founded by um, a Russian woman named Madame Blavatsky. Um, it incorporates a lot of, um, you know, comparative religion, you know, study of mysticism, the occult. She wrote, she wrote numerous books on this. The two biggies are... Um, uh, Isis unveiled in the secret doctrine, um, and Baum and his wife were full fledged members. I, I couldn't tell you specifically, you know, how long. I mean, I, I documented in the book when their membership took place, but I mean, they they were very much into this, and uh, you know, it, it 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 was really sort of a, a secret, not a secret society, a society dedicated to the pursuit of arcane wisdom for self improvement, self betterment, explaining the mysteries, things of that nature. Um, and Baum and his wife um, were were uh, both members of uh, Theosophy. Okay, well, that's a pretty strong involvement. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of famous people have been interested in uh, metaphysics and mysticism. Uh, certainly Elvis Presley was a, se- a spiritual seeker. Uh, he spent time at the, uh, I think, the Theosophy uh, Center there in uh, Beverly Hills. But he was just a seeker in general, uh, and he used to like to read books. I like to read books, too, but I'm not involved in any of the organization. But some people really do get involved in it. Uh, another person from... Uh, a famous person, of course, was Jack Parsons, who uh, was the rocket guy. And his, oh, name is, his name is often associated with Aleister Crowley. However, Aleister Crowley, and uh, we had a, a fellow on who uh, wrote a book about Aleister Crowley. Crowley's perspective on Parsons was, this guy's a nut. <laughs> so, you know, they, they were associated, but they weren't necessarily uh, that connected. But it definitely sounds like Baum, Mr. and Mrs. Baum were very connected. Yeah, well, I mean, Crowley, Crowley, you get involved with him with Ian Fleming. Um, during World War One and Two, Alistair Crowley was a spy for the British Crown. And um, during World War Two, his handler was none other than Ian Fleming, who wrote the James Bond stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and you will find this very uh, heavy um, occult involvement with Ian Fleming and, and Alistair Crowley. Crowley wanted to perform demonic rites and rituals around Rudolf Hess when the British captured him to try to find out um, more about the Nazis and their fascination with mysticism. And another guy who was involved with the same crowd was Dennis Wheatley. Um, and Wheatley wrote a book called The Devil Rides Out. Um, and that was made into a movie by Hammer Studios in the late 1960s. And in that, you have a character of uh, a character called Mokata, who is the black magician who brings forth the goat of Mendes. Um, and Mokata is clearly based on Aleister Crowley. Um, he, he ran in the circle with this espionage circle with Fleming and uh, Dennis Wheatley. Um, and it's interesting, the name of, of Mokata, um, years later, Ira Levin, the author of Rosemary's Baby, actually pays homage to Wheatley in, in Rosemary's Baby. He names the character of his black magician is Stephen Mokata or Mercada. It's, it's the same name. It's spelled only a little bit different. But uh, Mokata and Mercada. Um, were definitely uh, based upon the uh, Great Beast himself, 666 Aleister Crowley. You mentioned Hammer Films. Didn't they, Hammer, Hammer Film Productions, didn't they make a lot of really inexpensive um, horror, fright flicks, Ed Wood type things? Well, they're, a little, they're a little bit um, above the quality of Ed Wood. Um, <laughs> that's they, not yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's probably not saying much. Um, although I do like the Ed Wood stuff, but, you know, it, it's entertaining, of course, but not for the reasons Wood intended. Hammer made, the real claim to fame is making a string of Dracula. I mean, this is, of course, the movies with Christopher Lee as Count Dracula. They mm-hmm. made some Frankenstein movies, a string of horror movies, a lot of mummy movies throughout the late 1950s and early 1960s. They're a British studio. They're, these are the movies where Christopher, you know, the, the people, people know Hammer Studios basically from the Dracula movies. I want to say there's like five or six of them where Christopher Lee played Dracula and, and Peter Cushing played Van Helsing. And, and it's, 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 it's a string of Dracula movies. Dracula always winds up being killed, but being brought back. I mean, of course, they're loosely based on, on the Bram Stoker, on the Bram Stoker material. But yeah, I mean, um, 
Yeah, I would definitely say uh, Hammer Hammer Studios are probably a cut above than the uh, works put out by Ed Wood. Although, although some of the Ed Wood material does have some interesting stuff going in on it, probably Wood wasn't aware of it. Um, I talk about him being, you know, being under the influence of the collective unconscious because he does incorporate some unique things in his movies. But um, in Wood's case, I don't believe it was uh, intentionally placed. I think the best thing about Ed Wood was the movie Ed Wood. <laughs> with Johnny Depp. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, the the Johnny Depp Tim Burton movie is always a good one. Uh, Bella uh, Bella Lugosi, uh, Martin Landau won the Oscar for playing oh, Bella Lugosi. Yeah, I thought it was a great movie. I like um, like I said, I, I like some of the Ed Wood movies, but I like them for the reason, not the reasons Wood intended. Is that they're just so they're just so screwy to watch, um, mm-hmm. and so idiosyncratic with just horrendous dialogue. It, I guess it really gives birth to the phrase of um, so bad they're good. And I just remember one of some of the first times watching these movies. You know, you just sit back and it's just like, you know, what the hell is I'm, wa- you know, what is it that I'm watching here? I mean, is this actually even a real movie? I mean, they're just so so eccentric and so over the top, but um, entertaining. But again, not for the reason reasons would intended. Right, right. Uh, you mentioned Christopher Lee. He's 92 years old, still around. Yeah, Count Dracula himself. Yeah, he's. I, I didn't realize he's such a tall guy. He's six foot five. He is six foot five. Maybe he's yeah, he's uh, definitely getting up there. He was in the um, Lord of the Rings movies. That's right. That's right. He was uh, Sauron. Um, no, he was Saruman. Saruman the White. Um, yeah. And I talk about the. I get into the Lord of the Rings movies as well in in uh, cinema symbolism, which is again that, that this this echoes a lot of the Joseph Campbell material with the mono myth things of that nature. You know, the solar journey, the 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 hero's journey. Which you know, in Star Wars, it's Luke Skywalker. In in the Lord of the Rings, it's Frodo Baggins. Um, and I talk about a lot of the components going on into um, you know coming out of this solar journey, this path um, of this adventurer's path that is really a, a solar legend. Basically, um, it comes from the world of Joseph Campbell. I mean, again, if you want to see this those, in movies, go ahead. I'm I, sorry. I want to get into those stories on the other side of the break because we got about uh, two and a half minutes or so. Uh, sure. Let's go back to James Bond. So, what is the significance of Zero zero seven double oh seven. I don't know if I can get it get it in in two minutes. I'll certainly try. Um, zero zero seven is the signature of a um, Elizabethan spy and astrologer named Doctor John D, who was uh, a court astrologer for Queen Elizabeth, and he was involved with a spy ring run by a man named Sir Francis Walsingham. To make a long story incredibly short, um, when he would sign correspondences, espionage correspondences to the Queen, he would sign it zero zero seven. The symbol was actually supposed to be eyeglasses. It was a zero, a zero, and a line over it with a, a line down the side. Um, and the symbol meant it was for her eyes only, and that he was her eyes in the field. And, of course, this is where um, the idea of for your eyes only comes from in, in espionage. Um, and Fleming had seen it when he was working in MI5, had read a history book on MI5, and had read about D um, and the spy ring with Walsingham, people like Raleigh, Drake, Giordano Bruno was involved with this. But, yeah, the, the whole 007 with James Bond is an esoteric reference to this Elizabethan spy master and astrologer and occultist named uh, Dr. John Dee. Well, Dr. John Dee goes all the way back to the 15th century, and it goes to show you that there's really not much new under the sun. You know, they were there was just as much skullduggery and spy versus spy going on back then as there is today. Only now we oh, have absolutely. more toys. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, you had Dee working for the Queen. He's the one who, who picked um, January 15th of 1559 as her date of cor- coronation. Um, he picked that day specifically based on astrology, and it's a long story. Um, you know, with, with January's named after Janus. But, yeah, Dee, um, you know, is one of uh, England's early spy masters and uh, definitely an influence on Ian Fleming. Just amazing. Uh, we have our music playing in the background, Rob, so we're going to roll into our commercial break. If you're just joining us, our guest is uh, Robert W. Sullivan IV, and we're talking about his latest book, Cinema Symbology. The book is available at Amazon.com in print and in Kindle format, as well as his other book, The Royal Ark of Enoch. And you can follow his website at Robert W. Sullivan, and then IV for the fourth, Robert W. Sullivan, IV.com. And uh, when you go to the website, if you want to get an autographed book, you can get one right from there. We'll be right back in just a few minutes.
Hi, and welcome back to Far Out Radio on a Monday night. If you're just joining us, Robert W. Uh, Robert w. w. Sullivan the Fourth is with us, and we're talking about his new book, Cinema Symbology, a guide to esoteric imagery in popular movies. Who doesn't like a good movie? It's uh, kind of the American pastime, and uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in these films, and uh, a lot of symbology, and it's a good thing to know what you're looking at. Now, Robert, on the other side of the break, you briefly uh, started talking a little bit about uh, Star Wars and uh, a few other films. I remember when Star Wars came out in 1977, and I went to a, a mall, a mall movie theater with a giant screen, and this was like a religious experience, especially that opening scene. That that starship just looked like it was right over your head in the first place and it looked like it was never going to stop getting bigger. Uh, it was just an amazing thing. And people went to see that movie over and over and over again. It was just a, a, astonishing. Uh, people were were swept away with it. And this thing was a, a cultural phenomenon. But I'm I'm absolutely certain that nobody was thinking at all about any kind of esoteric meanings. Oh, no, I, I, I totally agree. You know, when, when I saw that movie for the first time, I was, a, you know, I was only six or seven years old. So, I mean, you know, I had no knowledge of this at all. It wasn't until years later that, you know, when I was, you know, doing this work that you, you come across Lucas. And actually, in, on my copy of the book that I have here of Joseph Campbell's The Hero with a Thousand Faces is a testimonial by George Lucas, who basically said, if you read this book, you will understand where the Star Wars movies come from. So when you read the book, I mean, yeah, I mean, you're going to see exactly where, what his inspiration was for this. Um, and it, it's a, it comes out of the world of Joseph Campbell, who was an American symbolist and mythologist. Um, and he documented, documents this thing called the hero with a thousand faces. But the hero that he's talking about is the sun. Um, and what he talks about is that this solar journey, uh, you know, that, that this hero's journey has these certain things that always happen. Um, and they, they seem uniform to it. And you'll find this in Star Wars. Um, you'll find this in, in, in all, all three of uh, the Star Wars movies, you know, with Luke Skywalker being the solar hero. You'll find this the, the same components turning up um, in The Lord of the Rings with Frodo Baggins. You'll find it also in the Matrix movies with, with uh, Neo or Neo Anderson, Keanu Reeves. Um, you'll also find it in the, you know, you'll find it in the Narnia works by, with, with C.S. Lewis. Uh, and of course, you'll find it in Harry Potter. Um, you'll find these same sort of themes going on. And Campbell breaks it down as things like supernatural aid, which in Star Wars would be um, uh, Luke getting the lightsaber from Kenobi, and this would be um, in, in, in The Lord of the Rings where Frodo gets the mithril armor from Bilbo Baggins. It's these sort of components that happen to the solar hero. You know, and again, you have the, the whole idea with this is is that the solar hero is on a, on a is just that is on a savior mission. And for Luke Skywalker, it's saving the universe from the Sith or Darth Vader, um, the Galactic Empire. Of course, it's in Middle Earth, saving it from, uh, you know, uh, Sauron and the Lords of Darkness. Harry Potter, the Lord of Darkness again. Um, so you have these same sort of overarching themes going on um, with this. And and what what, it, what I talk about in the book, I get into much more specifically, is how these components turn up. But um, it's interesting, I'll just go into it real quick. You know, I mean, even within the Star Wars movies, you know, you have, I mean, it, you know, you have the name of Luke Skywalker. Um, I mean, his name literally means the sun. Um, you have the name Luke coming from the Latin lux, meaning light, and of course, what light skywalks the sun. Um, and again, you have a lot of mythology going on with this, where you know the sun is the sun god Apollo or Helios, and Apollo has the lunar sister Diana. This is why Luke has the you know the white you know the sister who always wears the right white robe symbolizing the moon. Um, so you'll find this very you know within Star Wars this very ancient mythology going on. <clears throat> Excuse me, you also find elements of um, the Egyptian um, take on, you know, s solar adoration, sun worship, solar symbolism as well. I mean, the Sith Lords that comes from the name Set, um, who was the Lord of Darkness in Egyptian mythology, who did battle with Horus, who was the Egyptian sun god. And again, this is comparatively Apollo. So, I mean, just a lot going on uh, mythology-wise within Star Wars. And you'll find these components turning up over and over again in things like Harry Potter, Matrix, Lord of the Rings, things like that. You know what George Lucas's company was named? Industrial uh, I can't rem Light I, I, and Magic. Well, there you go. I mean, right, exactly. I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, he he knows what he's doing. And like I said, he, I, the the copy of A Hero with a Thousand Faces I have here actually has a testimonial on him uh, by him on it. So you know, let there be no mistake about it. What do we know about George Lucas? Was he just a a student of uh, Joseph Campbell, or does his interest in uh, 
Gnosticism and, you know, spooky stuff uh, go deeper than that. Well, he definitely is into Campbell, and, you know, Campbell, Campbell ca- crosses a lot of sh- spectrums. I mean, mythology, Gnosticism, the occult, you know, things of that nature. You know, you know, th- th- this has been asked me before is, you know, where, where do these guys get this from? I mean, you know, with, with Lucas, you clearly, you know, will, will find the Joseph Campbell influence upon this. I mean, you know, with, with the Matrix movies, you'll find a very heavy Gnostic influence. Um, where, where the Wachowski brothers are getting it from, I couldn't specifically tell you, but that movie is decidedly Gnostic in general. But like with Lucas and, and a lot of these movie makers, you know, you, you know, you have Hollywood that is recreating this mythology. So, I mean, this stuff is somewhat known to these people. Um, but then, you know, at least you forget you've got things, you know, which is literally like a stone throw from the movie making industry, like Manly P. Hall's Philosophical Research Society, which, which is literally a stone's throw from Burbank, you know, which is this just huge library dedicated to the pursuit of arcane wisdom, occult wisdom, mythology, secret societies, things like that. So, you know, you'll find this, you know, stuff, you know, going on. And clearly with Lucas, you know, solar adoration. I mean, Lucas even, you know, when when you get into the next series of movies, Star Wars movies he made, you know, I mean, you'll find this influence again going into the, the next three Star Wars movies with Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. This is episodes one, two, and three, where you have Anakin Skywalker as the Jesus Christ figure. And the parallels with Anakin Skywalker and Jesus are just overwhelming. And, you know, again, this is something I document in the book. So he, he gives you also, in the first three movies, this, this Christ-like story. You know, and they, they parallel each other. You have Luke Skywalker as the savior figure, and then you've got the father figure as this uh, Christ-like figure also, Anakin Skywalker. And, and Lucas really does some interesting things in the first three Star Wars movies um, to play off your unconscious mind to, to tell you the story. Well, Lucas also, after the huge success of Star Wars, went right into his Raiders of the Lost Ark series, which is just you know, chock full of symbology and ancient mysteries. And you can make a whole... Um, did you do a study of those films as well? Well, yeah. I mean, the, the, the one thing with, 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 with Raiders of the Lost Ark that really is kind of interesting that they, they, that they really play on, I and mean, it's really in Raiders of the Lost Ark, and the first one is, is the whole idea of the... Ark of the Covenant being located in Egypt of all places. That's very unique, and and it's something I talk about in it's in the second book I'm writing right now called Cinema Symbolism. It, it, it's unique that he would do that, that they would place the Ark of the Covenant in Egypt. And what it what it tells me is and this ties into a lot of comparative religion. I and mean, this is something I definitely get more into in in the Royal Arch of Enoch book. Um, but the whole idea of the Egyptian influence upon Judaic Christianity, you know, and, and lot, you'll find a lot of parallels. Um, within the Egyptian religion, filtering into um, Judaism and into Christianity. Um, th- this has been explored through, throughout history by many scholars. Um, I'm not just talking off my cuff here. Um, right. You get into Jesu- you know, Jesuits who, who have gone into this, this work. So to me, it's almost like by placing the Ark of the Covenant in Egypt, it's sort of like an esoteric homage to the um, Judaic Christian roots of, you know, uh, of, of Christi- or the Egyptian roots of uh, Judaic Christianity is what I'm trying to say. The connections are astonishing. We've got our music playing, Robert, so we're going to take our last commercial break. If you're just sure. joining us, our guest this evening is Robert W. Sullivan IV, talking about his latest book, Cinema Symbology. This is a fun read, fun book. It's a huge book, too. Books available at Amazon.com in print and in Kindle format, and as well as his other book, The Royal Arch of e- Enoch. And you can follow Robert's work at Robert W. Sullivan IV for the fourth, Robert W. Sullivan IV.com. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Far Out Radio. If you're just joining us, you are spending this evening talking with Robert W. Sullivan IV about his latest book, Cinema Symbology. Robert, where I want to go for our last segment is to talk about the uh, the Matrix series, uh, the Wachowski sure. Brothers uh, film. Unlike The Wizard of Oz, poor Frank Baum's movie, 
Frank Baum. <laughs> the movie kind of bombed financially. Uh, it got great uh, reviews, but it didn't make a whole lot of money back then. They only made back on it about double what they spent on the movie. The um, The Matrix, on the other hand, this is astonishing. I just learned this uh, during the commercial break. The three films, now granted we're comparing three films as opposed to one film, but the three films had a total budget of $363 million for three films. The films have grossed worldwide $1.6 trillion. And remember, folks, for a billion is a thousand million, and a trillion is a thousand billion. $1.6 trillion for The Matrix. This film has touched a, a nerve with people, and it's still, it's still out there vibrating away, but in what I think are unexpected perspectives from when the movie came out in 1999, because I'm hearing a lot of people using the term The Matrix to describe this growing awareness of this hiding in plain sight control mechanism of our modern culture through technology. Now, in your book, you make, make the point that the, uh, the movie uses Gnosticism and numerology. How does that fit into the Matrix series? Right. The part of Gnostic teachings, and again, I'm plowing over a lot of material here, tie into the idea of there are, um, there are kind of two worlds, a spiritual world and a material world. And the material world is no good. It's to be abandoned. You don't want anything to do with it. And and the creator of the material world is this lesser god known as the Demiurge. Um, you'll find, you know, this is the wizard of the Wizard of Oz, uh, or the ogre in Jack of the Beanstalk. And in the Matrix, it's the creator of the false reality known as the architect of all things. He turns up in the second one. So you have the idea of, of this idea, of the abandonment of the bogus material world for the spiritual world, which is the truth. And you, you know, this is what exactly happens in the, in the Matrix movie is where Neo, you know, leaves the material world and goes to the spiritual world, which is the real world, to battle, you know, the enemies of mankind. So you have this very Gnostic theme going on of material versus spiritual. You'll find this also in a movie that came out in 1999 called uh, Fight Club, which has the same sort of theme going on. But within Gnosticism, you have this overarching theme of light versus dark, good versus evil. And this came from a philosopher known as Manny. Um, and of course, this you have in the Matrix, you know, with the, with the, you know, machines versus the, you know, crew of the Nebuchadnezzar being the good guys, the guys trying to stop the darkness, things like that, free mankind, things of that nature. But then you also have this other strain of Gnosticism coming in, um, by a, a philosopher known as Valentinius, who talked about once you've been in the material world, you know, he talks about like how there were these select groups of people who had done this, you know, were in tune with the spiritual, and, of course, this is what you have with the Nebuchadnezzar, with the people who have unplugged from the real world. These are now the people in the spiritual quest to defeat the evil demiurge, the evil materialism, you know, and, and, and liberate mankind, essentially. I mean, and, you know, you, you'll find, you know, again, you, you, deal in, you get into the whole idea of, you know, with Gnostic, not Gnostic themes, awakening, epiphany. Um, you have Neo, you know, going up the staircase to meet Morpheus. Dualism is a very important theme within Gnosticism, light versus darkness, male and female, sacred, feminine, masculine. So you have the name Morpheus, which is the guy who's going to bring Neo to the real world, yet in mythology, Morpheus is the god who puts people to sleep. So you have this incredibly dualistic play on his name. Neo, you know, and I'm just going through this very quickly, but, you know, goes up the staircase. You'll find the Masonic floorboard. He's going into ascension. He takes the red pill. Then, you know, he turns into Alice in Wonderland, goes through the mirror, goes through the looking glass, wakes up in the real world, gets flushed out by the machines who don't, you know, he's now awake, you know, he's, he's received epiphany. The machines, the bad guys, the, you know, don't want him. Then, of course, he's lifted cruciform up into the light, up into the, you know, up into the ship. And you're going to have the idea of Neo being the Luke Skywalker, the solar figure, the Christ-like savior. And this is, you know, announced in, in the movie when, when you, know, you ask about numerology, when Neo goes on board the, the, the bridge of the Nebuchadnezzar, um, they show it very quickly. It says, um, they, they show the uh, nameplate of the uh, ship, and it says Mark 311. Um, that's a reference, a uh, biblical reference to Mark 311, which reads, Thou art the Son of Man, and all darkness and demons bow down before you. So this is sort of announcing um, Neo as the, you know, Christ-like Savior of mankind. And, of course, you know, you'll, you'll find these attributes, you know, with Neo being killed and resurrected. You have um, the sacred feminine, Trinity, a very interesting name to give to her. 
Um, and again, this comes out of the Nag Hammani Library, which was a set of Gnostic teachings that said part of the Holy Trinity was the sacred feminine, hence her name, Trinity. So, I mean, just uh, overarching a, lo- a lot of uh, Gnostic themes going on inside the Matrix movies, you know, death and re- reawakening, false world versus, you know, real world, materialism versus spirituality, you know, savior figures, um, divine sparks, revelation, being brought to Gnosis or revelation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just, you know, within the within the entire Matrix movies, the first one really has it, you know, in overload form. Um, and again, part of Gnosticism is, you know, we talked about the Demiurge, this, this cre- god of the creator of the material world. In Gnosticism, the Demiurge has henchmen that work for him called the Archons. In, 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 in the movie, this would be the agents led by Smith. So, yeah, just within the Matrix movies, I mean, especially the first one. I, I, that that would really be what I would call like sort of the godfather of, an, of Gnostic movies. Mm-hmm. Would be the first Matrix movie. When I saw that movie, I was blown away. I, mean, I just I couldn't get enough of it. It was really cool. Oh really yeah, I mean, it's a, it, yeah, it's a great film. I want to ask you a question about Lord of the Rings. Uh, yeah, maybe this is just maybe this is just me. I'm not really sure, but in the movie Lord of the Rings, the uh, the, the creepy char- character Schmeagle, uh is has the ring. And he's obsessed, right. he has one of the rings, and he's obsessed with this thing. It just consumes him. Every time you see him, he's, he's always looking at the ring and he's doing the, my precious. And, you know, he's just consumed with this obsession of the ring. And I don't know if I'm just reading into this or, or maybe I caught something, but it seems to me that the ring in that movie is a metaphor for our modern day obsession with technology. If, in our modern world, it seems that if there's a technical spin on anything, we can't leave it alone. Whether it's nuclear uh, energy or computerized everything to the point where there will be no more. I mean, we're very quickly moving into a dystopian kind of a technological environment. But it seems like anything that's got technology wrapped around it, we become mesmerized. Just like Schmeagel and anybody else who got a hold of one of those rings. It, it's Did, absolutely correct. That? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's it for for Tolkien, the whole idea, the guy who wrote the, the Lord of the Rings, the whole idea. It, it, again, this ties into spiritual themes. It, it's it's when Tolkien wrote the book. Um, you know, this was pre you know internet and all on technology. But what he saw sure. it is, and again, it, you're on the right track. Absolutely, to, Tolkien saw it as obsession with materialism. You know, as as being too obsessed with the material world, belongings, things like that. Absolutely. I mean, he obsesses over it. I mean, it winds up, it, the ring actually owns him. Um, sure. And again, this ties into themes of Gnosticism, of abandonment of the material world for the spiritual world. Um, you know, we talked about, just briefly, and uh, just real quick, I mean, and this is, you know, the, the Matrix movie came out in 1999. You're absolutely right. You'll find another Gnostic movie that came out that same year. And I know we won't have time to go, go into it too much, but it ties into what you're talking about. It's a movie called Fight Club. And, and, and the, the whole thing with the ring with where Smeagol, you know, obsesses over the material ring, he can't live without it. I mean, this is what Tyler Durden warns warns the Ed Norton character. He says, "The things you own wind up owning you," and that's exactly what what mm-hmm. Tolkien was was trying to convey with this obsession over the material world and and the pitfalls and the problems that it can, can cause if you get obsessed too much with materialism. That's metaphorical, also for our modern way of life, where oftentimes people have so much stuff that their stuff owns them to the point where they have to go rent warehouses in order to store their stuff, or as George Carlin used to say, another place for my stuff. <laughs> oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, you have a lot going on, you know, You know, with, with the Lord of the Rings movies. I get into it a lot more in um, in the book. I mean, I know I know we're somewhat getting getting short on time here, but, I mean, you had Tolkien who lived through World War One. I. I mean, you have the whole idea of the, the Industrial Revolution, which is Sauron the White, who's Karl Marx. I mean, he looks like him. I mean, he even says it. You know, the, the whole thing with the orgs, or, you know, the ogres being the proletariat, the elves and the hobbits and the men being the aristocrats. So you have this whole Marxian theme going on with the Lord of the Rings. Um, you have a ton of mythology going on with with magic rings. I mean, you're right about the materialism, no question. Um, but you know, you know, a lot a lot of the magical ring material comes from the world of um, Germanic mythology. Richard Wagner. You have the whole thing with Sauron, with the all-seeing eye. So I mean, it's you all have amazing yep. stuff. Uh, yeah. Mark, we're, or Rob, we're, we're all out of time. Can we? Can you Thank come you. back in a month or so? 
Yeah, absolutely, Scott. I'd love to come back on. And let me Good. just wrap up by saying thank you for having me on Far Out Radio. I thought it was a tremendous show. Oh, well, thank you very much. And uh, you're, you're an excellent guest, and this is uh, fun material. And we'll do this again soon. Thank you. Okay, take care. That is our program for this evening. Thanks for being with us Friday night. Our pal Dean Henderson will be back with us, and we'll be taking a look at geopolitics. Thanks for being with us. Have a great week. Be back on Friday with more Far Out Radio.